So a little bit of information about what I want to provide to you today is uh, regarding training load and injury, injury incidents in table tennis. So two aspects which, which we work with closely and obviously I want to inform you and provide you a little bit more information about the things that you can do and which might be helpful uh, to you guys as well. So before uh, we start, just a little bit about me. So my full name is uh, Samuel Andrew Pullinger. So I'm born in 1987, and I was actually born in, in Brussels in Belgium. So I've got four years uh, of experience now working with the table tennis department and other sports within Aspire Academy, having previously worked uh, at a university in the UK. And my current role is the uh, head of sports science support for, uh, for table tennis. And I have a BSc, MSc and PhD in uh, Sports and Exercise Sciences from Liverpool John Moores University. Um, just a little bit of our outline from, from the workshop. So it will consist of three parts. So training load, injury incidents, and then we'll try and combine it and provide you information about training load and injury incidents in table tennis because this is what we're, we're obviously interested in. Um, so I want you to get a better understanding regarding what potential <coughs> injury can happen if we're not monitoring our athletes properly. Uh, so for the learning outcomes of the workshop, so for training load I want you to get a better understanding how this can aid athletic performance and how we can actually help our athlete. Uh, appreciate the function of training load monitoring and how it helps with training preparation. Uh, when it comes to injury incidents, be able to differentiate between all the different various designs that there is in the literature and that people use to actually monitor this. And then uh, also understand according to the age and the maturity of your athlete, because this is very important as well. If you have young athletes, uh, injury incidence varies according to their age and to their matur maturity. And then we'll have a combination, and uh, I'll explain a little bit more why monitoring sessions and levels of fatigue can actually help you as coaches apply uh, more individualized training sessions and actually reduce injury risk in, in, in young and senior individuals. Uh, so again, this is just covering what I've just said, so I won't go through it too much. So I'll go through a little bit of background. So if we have a normal table tennis player, we know that he requires some form of kinematic aspects, some form of physical demands, it's important for us to keep the player healthy. There's obviously some technical and tactical demands and some psychological demands. So obviously table tennis is actually a very, very complex sport. So it's not like other sports which are a lot easier because there's not as many demands. In table tennis, there's a lot of different demands that we need to be aware of to ensure that we can produce a player and that we've got players that can play at a very high standard. So, if we take any coach, so I would like to think I'm working very closely with Peter. So I would like to think that Peter usually knows where he wants to go when it comes to planning a session, but also planning um, uh, 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 training according to a season. He has some idea of how he wants to get there. And for me, it's important, obviously, that he stays on the right path. So obviously, many, 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 many balls is not something that I would recommend because there's too many balls, so it's becoming too complex. Playing with tables which have weird shapes, again, is going away from the game that we're playing. Running outside in the snow for this physical ability, again, is maybe a little bit too much, so I need to make sure that he stays on this right path. Um, so obviously, every single coach must have a method of monitoring progress. So everyone must monitor the progress of their athlete because we need to know if they're progressing or not. Whether they, this is from a technical perspective, whether this is from a physical perspective, we must be monitoring the athlete somehow to gain a better understanding of whether or not he's improving over time. The question now is, is the athlete on the right path to the goal? So do we know what path we need to take to ensure that we reach the goal that we've set? with our athlete or for ourselves. So again, like I said, we can do many different tests to ensure that we actually monitor progress. 
We can do table tennis specific, we can do counter movement jump like on the left to actually look at explosive power. We can look at flexibility, so there's many different tests that we can actually use. Uh, so a bit of background information. So if I was to ask people here, why do we monitor athletes? Could anyone give me an example of why we, why we monitor athletes? <coughs> To check on their progress. Okay, so to check their progress. So there's many reasons that we, we might actually monitor athletes. So when we actually have a look at why people monitor athletes, there's many different reasons. So one of them, like you said, is to increase the scientific evaluation to monitor progress, which can help increase the effectiveness of the training that we're providing the individual. Another one might be for planning. Because obviously, if we've got different athletes, we need to plan accordingly for their needs. So obviously, training sessions need to be individualized according to the level of the athletes, the age of the athletes, and the ability of the athlete. Maybe because it's popular, because we've seen someone else do it. So we, we have many coaches who follow a style because a different coach from a different country has been successful with this style. So we, we just follow it because it's popular maybe for team selection, so you can actually assist us with identifying potential injury problems, illness, burnout, and readiness for competition. So if we have to select X amount of athletes to represent our club or to represent, we will do it according to what we believe or who we believe is the one that is ready for, for the competition in question. Uh, we also do it for accountability, because obviously this in increases the self-awareness of the athlete. So if we have specific time points throughout the year where we test, and we say that the athlete m must improve, otherwise he will do more conditioning, there's a likelihood that he might do some extra work at home. So it's his accountability and his responsibility to make sure that he's following uh, the guidelines that we've set for him. Also, because it pays the bills. So some individuals are actually getting paid to do this stuff. So obviously, I mean, I'm very interested in sports science, but one of the reasons which I do it as well is because it pays the bills. And why not? What else are we going to do with our time? <laughs> so now a bit of background information why we should not monitor athletes. Maybe because there's insufficient resources, so there's not enough time or money. Although this is very important to understand, there is always a gold standard, something which is slightly worse, something which is slightly worse, something which is slightly worse. So we can always test and inform ourselves. It might not be the best test, but it provides us information that, it, that might be important to us if we do it over time. Because it can predict failure. Sometimes athletes think that if they're not reaching a certain standard or a certain level, that they will be unable to win. But again, this is not what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to make them better. Uh, sometimes it sets unrealistic expectations. So athletes think that if they get monitored and they get given individualized training sessions and they're training, that it will make sure that they're winning, but this is not the case. Uh, sometimes scientists want power. So obviously monitoring is a shield for protection. So this is not something which I want to do. I want to work with the coach, not against the coach, because I want to be busy or look like I've got stuff to do. I actually want to inform the coach and the player and to make sure that all the information which is collected is useful to uh, the coach and the athlete himself. Maybe because there's a poor rationale, so there's no clear vision of what we actually want to achieve. Why are we testing? So why are we monitoring? Because it's a new toy. Obviously everyone likes to have a new phone, a new toy, a new piece of equipment. So we might play around, have a little play with it, but we're actually not really understanding what it's measuring. We're just doing it because we've seen other people use it. Uh, bad team dynamics. So if someone is better than the other, it might create division within your team or within your squad. Again, this is not something that we're trying to achieve. And then inexperience. So many sports scientists which are starting out might not have the experience to actually interpret the findings which are being found or which are being uh, 
uh, provided by the piece of equipment that we're using. So it's important that we actually understand what we're measuring and what we're testing. So, as I mentioned earlier on, many athletes, coaches, support staff are using a very scientific approach when it comes to designing and monitoring training programs. Obviously, through suitable monitoring and load monitoring, we can actually minimize the risk of developing non-functional overreaching, illness, and or injury. So this means there's a smaller likelihood that our, our players might be overtrained and actually get an injury as a result of too much training and not enough recovery. And again, appropriate load monitoring can actually help us determining whether or not an athlete is adapting to the training program that we're providing. So obviously training load, what is it? So training load is actually very, very simple. So it's how difficult and how hard is an individual training during the session. So very, very simple. It's calculated through the consumption of critical energy sources. So this is your carbohydrates and your proteins during exercise or through intensity of the exercise that you're providing. What's very important to understand is the training load is not the same as training volume. So we could have the same training volume, but a different training load. So it's two completely different factors. So the training load is actually the volume and the intensity of the training which you're giving to the athlete or the individual. So there are three types of training loads. So obviously we have the first one, which is the training load that we've pre-planned at the start of the season. Okay? Then we have one that we actually prescribe on the day. So on the day it might be different than what we planned initially at the start of the season. And then the reality is that the training the athlete actually performs on the day is the real training load. Because it might be that we've planned ahead and that we've made sure that we wanted a specific training session, but the athlete might not be up to this standard to perform at the level that you expected that day. So this is the one that's actually very important and that gives us more information about the load or the and the intensity of the training that's been performed. So there's many different types that we and ways that we can actually quantify this. So we can do it through questionnaires, through diaries, through physical monitoring, or just through direct observation. And I think in table tennis, we tend to use the latter. So we tend to look at direct observation of how the athlete is feeling, the training that we're providing, to actually look at what the training load or the intensity of the training session is. So obviously then we can apply this training data and we can uh, split this in different categories. So what is the motivation and systematization? What is the training prescription that we've provided? And what sports science can help to quantify this training load? But what's important to understand is very few training load markers actually have any evidence or any support to say that they should be used and that, and that they're very, very important to be used. So there's still a lot of research ongoing to say this is what we should use, we shouldn't use this, we should only use this one. So there have actually been a lot of ways looking at internal and external loads to, to quantify and monitor training load in individuals and in athletes. So I just want to explain a little bit uh, this internal and external. So external is uh, an objective measure of the work that an athlete completes during training or during competition. So this is measured independently from the internal workload. The internal workload is actually the stress that we're putting on the body when we're doing a specific training session. So how is this affecting the body? So with the internal workload, we can actually provide more information regarding recovery and regarding the intensity of training. Um, so these are examples of internal and external load me measures. So external load measures can be done through time motion analysis, doing tests looking at power output, speed, acceleration, neuromuscular function, while internal load measures is a training impulse of heart rate, RPE, and blood lactate. Um, 
So for trading load, we know that it's the quantification of training uh, in order to prepare an athlete for competition. Um, obviously, obviously, it's not possible to identify the, the effect training has on an individual if we, if we don't quantify workload. So if we don't know what the workload is, we can't un identify the effect of the training on the individual. Um, if there is no in-depth information provided or, or no, we can't provide any information and it's no value to the coach, so it doesn't help. So when we look at training load in table tennis, for example, and we search this online, we can see that there's only seven items which are coming up. So there's little research available, there's not much available, so this is a very new thing when it comes to table tennis. This is very, very new, something that we've not really used before. So these, or this is some of the equipment that we're currently using with some of our, our athletes. So to, to provide a little bit more information, this is a heart rate that the athletes are wearing throughout the competition, which is collecting 200 data sets every uh, second for heart rate or for, for accelerometry and one heart rate measure every second for heartbeat. Um, hmm. We have a little look, this is some of our athletes training, and this is some of the live information that is being provided. So you, as you can see, there's four players training, and these are the current heart rates according to their maximal heart rate. So this is live information that, that is being fed to the coach and to the sports line support staff. So if we're doing specific exercises such as many balls and we know they're reaching a high, high heart rate, we don't want them to exceed specific limits so we can give them recovery until it goes back down to ensure that there's less chance of injury and they've got enough time to recover to perform the next exercise. So if you have a little look, these are four different training sessions. So as you can see, they're all varying in time, all varying in duration, and all varying in intensity. So the first one, for example, was an example of physical testing, or the beat test. So as you can see, the heart rate is increasing over time until he reaches a peak and stops. So this was just an example of physical testing. Uh, testing. Second one was physical and technical training. The third one was an interval technical training, so he's being provided more recovery in between. While the last one, as you can see, is very, very low, so this is an example of service or, 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 or serve training, whatever you would like to call it. So obviously th then we collect all these results and we have all the information for all the athletes over time. And what we do is we split according to different intensities for different individuals. So the uh, training load unit that we use is something which is called Edwards Trim. So just to explain very simply, the higher your heart rate, the more intensive your training session, so the more intensive your result. So what do we actually find when we have a look at individuals and our squads over time? So we're finding that there's a variation during weeks. So even though that it might be that we've set the same load for the same week, it's varying every single week. Um, again, what, what, what our main focus is on is to, to make sure that the training load is also lower when there's competition. So we make sure that pre-competition, the training load is reduced because we want to reduce injury risk so we make sure that this is done through suitable monitoring. Uh, if we have a look at training hours, for example, so we can see that when individuals are, com are in competition or in the lead up to competition, training sessions are less uh, and matches vary according to time of year. So for us, for example, there's more matches in June and August and hardly any matches in, in January. But this is according to the schedule that was set when we looked at some of our players. If we then compare according to age categories, not unsurprisingly, senior players are covering more distance when they're playing, 
working at a higher intensity and they're doing more accelerations and decelerations at the table because they're able to play for longer. So they make less mistakes, so they play longer duration and they're making more movements. So it's more intensive and there's more load. But when we explain findings, these must be relevant. So this is very, very important. We shouldn't test or, or collect any information just for the sake of collecting information. So obviously, progression of training load is achieved in different training groups by the coaching staff. So this is something that needs to be agreed with the coach and that is monitored by myself. We can also be monitored by the coach indirectly by asking the athlete how he feels, etc. So we must also involve the athlete in the process. This is very, very important. Um, obviously, the age plays a major role with the style that an individual plays and also shows that demands are higher, movement patterns vary because obviously he's older so he's able to move better. So all this needs to be taken into consideration. So something which might seem easy for a senior individual is not always easy for a young individual because we need to understand that they're still growing, they're still maturing. So doing the same exercise, even though it might be shorter, might mean that they've got a higher load. So it might be more intensive for them. So it's something that we need to be aware of. So obviously for this reason, it's important that we actually quantify training load and that we have a look at our different age groups at how it might affect them. Um, obviously from my side or from a sports science perspective, it's important that more research is, is conducted so we can actually provide better guidelines for coaches, for players, in order to, to optimise their training and provide you with more information to, to uh, train your individuals. So what's a take-home message? So obviously, as much information as possible is good. We need to make sure that the coach is confused, the player is confused. <laughs> this is very important. Obviously, this is the only way that a sports scientist can justify his position, or that you as a coach can justify testing and monitoring your athlete. So you need to provide loads of information. So now on to injuries, because obviously we're all interested to make sure that our players get injured as little as possible. So we know that injuries are from acute trauma or from a repetitive stress. And in table tennis, we have this repetitive stress because we're doing the same movements, the same pattern of movements with our legs, with our arms for a long period of time. So we have a risk of this overuse injury. So sports injuries can actually affect your bones, your soft tissues, ligaments, muscles, and tendons. So there's many areas that can get injured playing sport. What do we actually know though regarding injury incidents in, in, in table tennis? Well again, there's not much data available, so we don't know so much. We actually don't know much about injury data. Uh, what we do know though is that senior and junior players compared to other sports don't have that many injuries. Why? Because there's a lack of contact, there's not much contact in the sport. So obviously the injury tends to be more from overuse, from, from doing the same movement. Uh, if we then have a look at senior and junior athletes, most of the injuries tend to be muscle tissue and affect the shoulder. So the shoulder seems to be the area where boys or athletes, whether it be senior or young ones, are getting injured. So it tends to be the shoulder area because of the movement. Whether it's due to bad technique, overuse, it could be a combination of both. So if you actually have a look compared to other sports, we're finding that table tennis is actually very low. While sports such as squash, gymnastics, or athletics are much higher. Mm. And fencing again is similar to table tennis, very low because they're not doing any or having any contact. Again, if we have a look at the literature, injuries in table tennis, we're only finding 30 research articles which have some relation to either table tennis or to injury. So again, this is not so much information. So only 30 articles are being found. So what are, what are our problems as, as coaches and as practitioners working with table tennis? So like I said, small amount of literature available. Again, this literature and the information which is available actually varies. 
So people use different methods to analyze and to quantify how they assess injuries. So this means that there's a validity reliability issue for comparison and whether or not the information that is collected and that is provided is actually true. Um, and also when we ask individuals whether or not they're injured, they might lie. Because they don't want to say to the coach that they're injured because they don't want to seem weak. And this is a major issue that we're finding, especially with younger players, because they want to make sure that the coach likes it because they want to be included. So they might lie in order to play a competition, but which then increases the risk of injury longer term. Mm. So this is something that we need to understand and we need to have a good dialogue with, with our players, especially when they're slightly younger. And also with the older ones, because it pays the bills for some of them, because they're getting paid to play. So if they're injured and they can't play, they might not get paid. So what can actually be done? So we can actually, do a study or collect information with highly trained individuals, so adolescents, this is senior and young, using a surveillance record, so working with, with uh, physiotherapists and doctors to collect all the data that we have to actually have a look at what information we can actually find. So this is something that we've started doing and that we're, we're still in the process of doing over the last uh, 10 years that we've, that we've had we've had Aspire. So injury assessment. So obviously, what the physiotherapy or the doctor does is to establish the extent of the injury, so what is the incidence and what is the severity, um, how did he get injured, where is he injured, what are the mechanisms. Obviously, we then need to introduce a pre preventive measure to, to make sure that he can recover, and then we repeat this step to assess whether or not it's effective. So we have all this information, like I said, for about 12 years, I believe, for 50, 60 players. So we started putting all this information together to see whether or not we can find patterns. So we can then further divide these injuries. So obviously we have injuries, which are very common, where there's no time loss. So if someone has a little bit of pain, but he can still train. So we often have this in table tennis little bit sore, sore arm, sore shoulder, but he can still do some form of training. And then we've got the injuries that we don't like, which is the time loss injuries. So the injuries where athletes and individuals have to take time away from training, time away from competition. So with the time loss, like I said, they're missing X amount of days because they have to have treatment and they have to have a clinical uh, uh, examination. So what types of uh, training load injuries and severity do we find? So we can have overuse injuries, injuries related to growth condition, which is common with young individuals because they're still growing, they're not fully mature. Traumatic injuries, so this might be a leg break that doesn't always happen within the sport. It can happen when they're playing with their friends or when they're outside of the hall. And then obviously the severity of the injury will be according to how many days is missing. So it can go from a slight injury, which is one day, to a moderately serious, which is two to 28 days, to a very serious injury where he's missing more than a month. And these are the types of injuries that we don't really like. Because we don't want individuals to be out for a long duration, especially because our sport is very technical and tactical. So if we define these a little bit more, as you can see, we have traumatic injuries, which are injuries resulting from a specific and identifiable mechanism. So this can be due to contact or non-contact, but we know why it's happened. Overuse injuries, like we all know what it is, from uh, a specific mechanism or movement that you're doing many times over time. And then growth condition injuries are very unique to the young population. So this is when children and adolescents are playing sport, According to their maturity levels, they'll, they'll all come or have some form of growth condition injury. And according to age, this will vary for different body parts. So for example, when we're very young, so 12 and below, it's a lower extremity of the body, so the ankle and the foot, which tends to be the most common injury. As we grow older, it becomes the calf and the knee. And as we grow older, so we, we're talking 17, 18, it becomes the hip and the lower back. So 
So again, this is very important that we understand according to age, the type of injuries that we can actually um, that can actually occur. So what do we actually find when we look at injury assessment? So we're finding that there's a lot of injuries within youth cohorts. So for every thousand hours of training, if you have a look on the right, there's 8.3 injuries per athlete. So this is quite a lot. But what's interesting is it's more or less half-half when it comes to time loss and no time loss injuries. So half of the time they're injured, no time is being lost in training, and the other half of the time, uh, time is being lost uh, in, in, in training. So there's only actually four injuries for every thousand hours of training that the athletes are undergoing. And then these can be split according to overuse injuries and growth conditions. So acute and overuse injuries are nearly 50% for all injuries with time loss. And growth conditions, again, are nearly 50, are, no, a quarter of all the in injuries in youth individuals. So what's important or what's interesting is where these injuries are actually located. So if we take a human skeleton and we have a look in a little bit more detail, we can find that the slight majority of injuries in youth individuals is actually located at the lower part of your body. But again, it's more or less 50-50, so it's 56%, so slightly more than half. And 50% is the upper part of the of the uh, of the body does anyone have an idea why why it might be that we get so many injuries at the lower extremity of the body does anyone have any idea why this might be sorry yes yeah, so we're a little bit weaker because we tend to concentrate a lot on the upper body because we want to be strong and we want to be fast and we want to be explosive and we're, we're neglecting this leg work and this explosiveness and, and this strength, agility and quickness. So these are things that we can actually incorporate in warm-ups. So what we can do in warm-ups by using a lot of uh, footwork is actually increase the power of the legs to make sure that there's less injuries in, in, in these individuals, which is obviously beneficial over time as well. When they're older, they'll have less problems with imbalance, etc., and lower back issues. Uh, so we have a lot of Issues again with this spine, spinal injuries through overuse. So again, why are we having spinal injuries? Because uh, the way that we play might not be the correct technique. So we're bending forward too much or we're bending backwards a little bit too much. And again, why is this? Because our legs are not strong enough. So if we have stronger legs, we're able to have a better technique and put less pressure and less load on our back. Uh, and then 24% of all injuries are the apophysis. So this is the ankle, the knee, and this waist, so the hip. So these are obviously three important, very important parts of the body in table tennis because we're doing a lot of rotation with our trunk. We're doing a lot of movement with our feet. So obviously the knee is very important because it needs to be placed in different positions according to different shots that we play. And we need to be very agile, so we're moving our ankle a lot to do fast movements. So it's not surprising that a lot of the injuries actually occur there. And then the muscle spasm is the most common injury when it comes to acute or insidious injuries. So again, why is this? Often because we're not performing a long enough warm-up. So because athletes and individuals want to do quick, 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 quick warm-up, go onto the table, and then they feel a little pull or a little tear, and then they have a muscle spasm. So again, very important to incorporate this slightly longer warm-up to make sure that our athletes are nice and warm before they go onto the table. Because it's very easy to come to the hall. We're five minutes late, everyone's already started. Instead of doing our five, 10 minute warm-up, we get, go straight onto the table and play. And then obviously our muscles are cold, all of a sudden we have a muscle spasm and we're injured. So this is something that we as coaches and as sports practitioners can actually make sure that doesn't occur, doesn't happen. So if you have a look at when injuries actually occurred, so you can see they're occurring at different time points of the year. So funnily enough, we had no injuries in November or December. So none of our boys are getting injured in November or December, but most of them are getting injured at different time points of the year. Most of it being around this 
free competition period when we're increasing training load because we want them to be nice and fit, nice and strong for competition, and maybe we're not providing them with enough recovery time, so we, we, we tend to find a few more injuries. And then the first quarter of the year, again, 65% of injuries uh, took place. But what's the severity of our injuries? So the good thing is only a third of injuries are minor. So not much time is being lost when it comes to injury within table tennis. So 40% 40 is minimal, so only two to three days lost. So very good, this is good. And 60% are mild, so four to seven days. So we're not getting these long duration injuries of seven days or more, which is good obviously for us. Um, again, no serious injuries, like I said. Obviously this doesn't mean that they don't occur because they can occur. They can occur, especially with younger individuals. And like I said, over the course of a year, the amount of days lost for injury are only 2.4. So it's very, very low. So we have a low incidence sport. And this means that we're not getting too many injuries. So obviously this means that the, the, the athletes and the boys have got high levels of training because they're doing many hours, which means they've got a reduced risk of injury. So again, if we compare this to the other sports, like I said earlier on, it's much, much lower. So most of the injuries, for a small discussion point regarding the injuries, is due to overuse. So like I said, we need to look after our athlete. Uh, again, we've got a high prevalence of growth-related conditions just because the movements that we're doing are related to these areas where athletes can get injured, so this lower extremity of the body. And it's often due, like I said, to this training specificity. Um, and only 88%, so nearly all injuries were minor, so this is very, very good. Not much time is being lost. So a little take-home message regarding this. So when you're providing training sessions, there is a cost and there is a benefit to anything that we do with our athletes. But there is also a risk. So this is something that we always need to take into account. What is the risk of the training that we're providing these individuals and what is the cost and the benefit? So is it beneficial to do an extra half an hour when we see that the athlete is dead? Maybe not. Maybe it's not. So if we're pushing, 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 we're actually increasing the risk and decreasing the benefit and increasing the cost that it might have. So we need to be a little bit more intelligent with how we act and interact with our training sessions and with, with our athletes. Because it's very, very important that we keep them in the sport also. Um, so now, if we combine these two, because this is what I think is, is very interesting and very very important is a combination of this training load and injury incidence. So if we have a high training load, does it mean we have a high injury incidence? So this is something that I've actually been looked at quite a few times. And it's been found that the harder the individual trains, the more chance that he can get injured, which makes sense. Obviously, if we take recovery into account, maybe we can actually decrease this risk with the individuals. So there is some form of relationship between these two. But it's very, very complex. So it's not as easy as saying, if he doesn't train tomorrow, we train slightly less, he won't be injured. So we can have a look at many articles which are available which look at uh, injury risk and training load. And the main thing we're finding is high training workloads alone, like I said, do not cause sports injuries. So there is another issue. There's other things which are playing a role and playing a factor. When the athlete has been injured or the individual has been injured, are we providing them enough time to actually come back to a safe environment to play again? Or are we pushing him to train, 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 train? Because obviously, as we know, the technical and tactical demands of the sport require this. We want them to come back straight to the table because we're scared that he'll lose his technical ability. Because we've done so much work beforehand and we don't want to lose this skill that he's acquired over six months of training or one year of training because we're scared that he will while he's injured. 
So maybe by providing him more time away, we're actually making sure that he's coming back safely and that he's not going to get injured again. So if we have a little look at individuals, what, what do we tend to find? So if we increase training load, and we train a lot, so approximately 700 hours of exposure per year, we're actually increasing injury risk by twofold. So it means that training more is not always training better. And because there's a lot of different aspects to the game of table tennis, we can actually vary our training sessions accordingly during the week, during the month, to ensure that we're not increasing this load too much. So in a, if, if an athlete is tired, there's a simple solution. What can we do? Let's do some service training. Because we're decreasing the load, but he's still playing. He's still playing and using exercises which are related to the game and important to the sport. So obviously the monitoring and the well-being is critical to success. But why? Why is it critical? Well, what we find is that overuse injuries nearly always involve training errors. And who do we think is in charge of these training errors? Not the athlete, but the coach. The coach is actually the one who is giving the training. So the coach is actually affecting the potential of this overuse injury. So obviously we as coaches and as sports practitioners are accountable for when our players become injured due to overuse. Because there's easy ways to ensure that this doesn't happen. Um, again, when, when our overuse injuries uh, and many burnouts occurring, when the training and the competition is exceeding this recovery time that we're providing. So if we're not providing enough recovery time and we're not providing enough rest, there's an imbalance between the training and the recovery. So the more imbalance that you're building over time, the higher the risk of injury. So what, what we can do is be closer to our athlete and ask him how he's feeling. How are you feeling today? Are you tired? Are you able to train for two hours? So we need to strike some form of agreement, some form of balance with our athletes, with our individuals, to make sure that we can optimize. Again, fatigue actually contributes directly to ACL, so uh, anterior cruciate ligament injuries. So due to increasing fatigue over time, uh, you actually have more risk of this ACL injury. So what we can do is to make sure that our individuals are not too fatigued. Um, obviously when we have unusual increase from, of training load, so let's say an athlete is coming back from having done nothing, and we want to work, 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 work at a high intensity, there's a higher risk that he gets injured in the four weeks following this. So especially when we're coming back from an injury or coming back from a competition where the load and the intensity has not been so high, no need to straight away go high intensity, high intensity, high intensity. Um, obviously a player's average training time and the training intensity plays a role in, in injury, so this is normal. Um, so obviously it's important for us to manage this training load. Uh, obviously this can be done through many, many different ways. And it's important because we can actually improve performance over time. I know that as a coach and as a sports practitioner there's a lot of pressure to get direct results. Because they're asking, why is your athlete not winning? Why is your athlete not improving? But it might be that he's improving in other areas because it takes time to improve. It takes a long time to improve. It's not a short process like other sports. For example, in rugby we can gain eight kilos through nutrition, through gym, and it's easy, he looks bigger. But in table tennis you can see individuals six months and you're looking, coaches can see that he's improving technically, but how can we show this to the people above? Because the results aren't following. So there is a structure, there's a procedure that we need to follow. So it's important that we don't always change the structure that we have to please other people or other, other individuals. Um, obviously, like I said, in order to have the greatest benefit from training, 
We need recovery. Everyone needs recovery. When we're working hard and we're working 12 hours a day, if we work 12 hours every single day without recovery, who will be tired? Sure, I will be tired. Am I able to then produce the same level of intensity and the same level of work the next day and the day after? Probably not. So we need to understand that they're no different to us. Also, they need recovery. It's a normal procedure and a normal aspect in life that people need uh, recovery in order not to burn out. So like I said, to minimize this risk of developing non-functional overreaching, illness, injury, can be achieved through load monitoring. We don't always have to go into complex ways of monitoring load. We can do it simply. We can ask after a training session, how was your intensity? How difficult was it? We have a scale, zero is not difficult at all. 10 is very difficult. And we can collect this over a week to start getting an understanding of the training sessions that we're providing and the intensity that individuals are perceiving. So it might be that providing the same intensity in the same session to two individuals gives you completely different results. So again, it's very important to actually understand our different athletes. This is what we don't want. We don't want to increase this training load and then increase the risk of injury. We want to reduce it. This is what we want. We want our, our athletes to be able to train as much and as long as possible. Um, so like I said, despite the research that there is regarding training injury relationship, there's not so much information available in table tennis, whether it be senior or junior athletes. Um, so where do we go next? So what we want to know is, does a higher training load result in a higher, higher likelihood of injury in table tennis. So this is something that we, we're collecting, we're looking at, because it's important to find out, because it's informative to everyone. Um, what are the effects of growth and maturation? So do we know whether or not an early maturer has more injury risk than a late maturer? So we, we've started collecting information and we actually have some information available. So what we're finding is that late maturers tend to have injuries at an earlier rate, than the, sorry, the early maturers have injury at an earlier age than the late maturers, which makes sense. So it might be the late mature is getting injured at the age of 12, and the same injury is occurring with the late mature at the age of 15 or 16. So this is something I want you to take home. More than 50% of all injuries are actually preventable. So more than 50%, imagine. So this is more than half. So we're playing a major role in preventing injuries with our athletes. Because obviously we're the most important individuals when it comes to this planning of training, which is where the athletes and the individuals tend to get injured. But the question is, what can we do? What do you, let me open it up first. What do we think we could do as coaches, as, 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 as people working within table tennis to reduce injury risk to help our athletes. What, what could we do? Minimize the training load. So okay, we can minimize the training load, <coughs> is, is, is a good example. Then I think we can include our athletes. So again, this is very educate, important. Educate, educate our athletes, uh, make them more aware and include them and have a good communication. So like, like, like Peter said, obviously it's a process where individuals are working together. We're not working against each other, whether it be with our athletes or other members of the team. It's important that we have the same vision and the same structure when it comes to planning and to preparing. Because if we have two coaches working with one athlete and there's no communication, and we're both doing high intensity training, on different days, because we've not communicated, we're putting our individual at risk. So we're putting the athlete at risk because we're not talking with one another, we're not being open with, uh, with other members of staff. So obviously, from my side, I think the most important is, like we've discussed, is to look after our players. So it's very important to look after our players, whether it be from a training perspective, whether it be simply asking how are things, 
because it can be that they have issues at home we don't know if we're not communicating with them we don't know what other issues they might have so it's important to ask them how they feel this is one of the ones I think is very very important to schedule competitions intelligently because I know from my experience of working in, in, in many different sports and many different youth sports and senior sports that we try and put as many games and as many matches in two, three days to make sure that the competition is finished quick, quick, quick because we don't want it over a longer duration of time. So maybe if we scheduled it a little bit better, so maybe not have as many games would be better for our athlete rather than playing every hour, let's say, because there's a high demand or having long days, starting seven in the morning and then finishing 10 at night. Maybe this doesn't help, especially the younger individuals, because for them it's very difficult. They become tired and uh, it doesn't help with their progression to senior table tennis. We also need to get away a little bit from the thinking that more training always provides a better player. So this is not always the case. Maybe better training provides a better player. Maybe we need to start thinking about the training that we provide as individuals. Because like I said, table tennis is a very complex sport. So if we're only thinking about aspects at the table, we're neglecting many different other aspects, such as flexibility. Flexibility is very important. Does anyone, everyone here, as a coach, make sure that their athletes are stretching for 10, 15 minutes after they finish? Hands up. Who is making sure? Um, warm down session? Is it warming down? Yeah. Cool so down, cool down. part of the warm down, we can do this part of the warm down because this is the ideal opportunity to do the flexibility work. 10 minutes of stretching. What do we think flexibility actually does? So flexibility is not because we want to have annoy the player or because it takes 10 minutes more. It's actually to help prevent the injury and to make sure that their range of motion becomes better. So it's actually a positive thing. We don't need to see it as a negative thing. Oh, I have to stretch for 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes more in the hall. No problem. We can finish slightly earlier and incorporate this in the call down. Again, this is something, and I'm sure Peter will agree with me, is that we need to start trusting our players a little bit more. I think this is very, very important. Because they're part of the system, they're part of the team as well. So they're saying, coach, a little bit sore today. Not sore, you play. Do we think this is a good idea? <laughs> but do we see it? We see it many times. And we've had, this, we've had the case where we, we, we have an athlete which is currently injured because the coach is saying, you're lying. <laughs> it's not so. So what has happened? Three weeks injured. Four weeks injured. So from training the extra week at a high intensity through pain has resulted in four weeks lost. As opposed to three days lost if, if we'd given him three days off. But does it mean we need to give him three days off training? If he has a sore shoulder, can we do something else? Yes. So can we do leg work? Mm -hmm. Sure we can do leg work. It doesn't mean that if someone has pain that we can't train. So this is very important to understand. This is most important. Most important thing to understand. You can always do something different or something else to ensure that they're still training. So that they're still in the hall, they're still part of the team. They can still do other things. So they can still do other work. If he has a shoulder problem, we, we don't do many balls because this is not going to help the athlete and not going to help the process. Again, this one I think also is very, very important to incorporate a proper warm-up. <coughs> so again, I'll ask, is everyone providing a proper warm-up? How long do we normally warm our athletes up? Or how long do we think we should warm our, our athletes up?
10 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. So what do we think we could actually do in order to make the warm-up a little bit more fun? Maybe we can incorporate a game. So maybe a game which involves reaction time. Maybe a game which involves running in, in teams, so races. Because what are you working? Then you're working reaction time, you're working some form of conditioning. So you're incorporating two in one. It might be that we incorporate what we call SAQ, so speed, agility, quickness. So lots of ladders, lots of movements. So if I was to give you an example of incorporating reaction time, two athletes standing opposite one another, one coat, and only take with right hand, once the coach whistles, first one to grab, reaction time. We can do left hand, we can do right hand, we can do back, facing towards each other, whatever it might be. What else would we do? So we could actually do two athletes facing each other, and you must shadow. So they must move according and follow one another. Then what might we do to make it slightly more diff difficult? Let's do the opposite. So you have to not be the mirror, but you have to be the counter mirror. So if one goes left, the other one goes right. So again, we incorporate in fun things within the warm-up. Another one that we can do, for example, is two athletes, knee slaps. So they've got a game, first of three, must try and touch the knee. So again, what are we doing? Speed, agility, movement, first of three, loser, three press-ups. So we incorporate in different aspects uh, in the warm-up, which means you don't have to have an extra session for agility or an extra, extra session for speed or an extra session for quickness. And then the last one, which goes according to trusting our players a little bit, is to make our player part of this training plan. So ask him, where do you think your deficiencies lie? So what do you think we need to improve as an individual? Coach, I think my service and my service received is not quite up to standard. Okay, let's start incorporating exercises with service, service received, because this is 75% of the game. If we take that on average, it's 3.2 shots per rally. This means that a third or two thirds is service and service received. So these are important aspects of the game. Of course, no one is saying that you don't need the technical ability and to be able to play the shots very fast when it comes to a rally. But the two most important aspects are the service and the service received because everyone will always have to play these. So let's incorporate exercises and drills which incorporate these two movements. So these are sort of the things that I want you to take home and to start thinking a little bit. I'm not the one to say that things are right or things are wrong. I'm just here to provide you information and to make you think about how you can change and actually become a better coach. Because everyone can improve. So we can always improve as people, as coaches, as individuals, with, with our sport and in general. So I'm not, not to say that things are right or things are wrong. I'm only here to provide a little bit more information and help uh, so you have a little think of what you can do to, uh, to progress. Thank you.